so that we can start with this. So, of course, let me see if I can also add a webcam, if that might be possible. Uh, I think it's better if I just do it like this. Anyway, uh, you, have, you have a chance to comment something in the chat. Uh, we will have also some polls later on. Uh, you can also ask questions and you can comment. Thank you, Mr. Irfan. Also, webcam for now, I don't know if you see it or not, but for now, let, let's keep it as it is. And slowly but surely, let us, let us see how we will do with this. So the first step today, I would like us to repeat the knowledge which we gathered last time. Having said that, uh, let us start and let's say that the first steps, of course, will be the steps of repeating the knowledge which was acquired five days ago. So, uh, the first thing we talked about last time was uh, an electrical insulation, of course. We are here to discuss the status of electrical insulation and IEEE defined this as a material or a combination of suitable non-conductive materials that provide electrical isolation of two parts at different voltages. Of course, we said that we can have one material like porcelain or we can have a number of materials like mineral oil and cellulose or some other combination. And then we proceed in saying that we can model the insulation as a capacitor and that the capacitor can be presented as an ideal capacitor or a real capacitor. Now, now we see here that the real capacitor contains also the resistor connected in parallel to the capacitor, and we can see some capacitors on printed circuit boards. Uh, we also learned that the resistive current running through this particular asset is the reason why we have these issues. So the resistive current running through the resistor is the problem because it is in phase with voltage, which in turn creates heat. And the heat creates a vicious circle, a chain reaction that can lead to some dramatic failures. And dramatic failures can result in a full, uh, fully blown explosion of a power transformer. Last time we also heard a Dutch legend of Hans Brinker in his village by sticking a finger in a dike. Since a small leak in a dike can quickly deteriorate, deteriorate the dike and we compare the dike to electrical insula insulation. We said that we cannot stick that finger when it comes to tan delta, but what we can do, we can surely assess what is the state of insulation per se. Now, uh, moving on, we also said that we can, uh, we heard that the TV can function normally, let's say, and uh, can you, I hope you can hear me well, guys, because I see some comments, some people are saying that my voice is breaking, it might be due to the connection. Anyway, I will try to speak slower. So we also heard that uh, a TV can function normally in an aquarium filled with mineral oil, but that we should take care of how much, of how much water is in that oil. And this is what we do with tan delta. Now, we, tan delta helps us estimate the state of our insulation, or let's say the state of uh, the mineral oil. And in order to do that, we uh, concluded the first part by saying that we measure tan delta so that we could assess the state of electrical insulation and to see if there were some geometrical movements inside the transform. Of course, when I say when I say uh, tan delta, it means it means that it is a um, uh, it is called also a power factor. So now I see that some people have problems with the sound. 
I cannot make my connection better. I mean, it's it was perfectly okay in the morning. The only thing I can do is talking like this. So you can let me know if you can hear me better without my headphones on and disconnecting the headphones. Um, uh, Andre, sorry. Uh, can you please uh, uh, try only sharing your screen and not the video because I think it was it was a uh, better audio with just sharing the screen. Sharing the screen. Okay, but uh, but not your but not the webcam, uh, just the screen. Ah, uh, you're right. You're right. Okay, makes so sense. Let's okay. Okay, guys, let me know if if the connection is now better okay so also let us move on and say that uh, tan delta can be tested not only on transformers which is power transformers but also measurement and protection transformers tan delta can surely be tested on rotative machines like generators and motors and it can also be tested on cables, medium voltage, high voltage cables, and it can also be tested on things like surge arresters, etc. etc. We said anything that has electrical insulation, you can test your transformer, you can test your tan delta or a power factor on that. So power factor equals almost equals tan delta. So what is the difference between tan delta and power factor? We, we saw in our next slide. We will see here, we said that tan delta is effectively the ratio of resistive current or in-phase current and the capacitive current. This is what we have. And also, uh, we said that power factor is very similar. It is ratio between resistive current and the total current. But as we mentioned, uh, if this angle is very small, and it is, then this total current here is usually not like this but it looks more something like this very close to the y-axis and if we divide this number with y-axis or with a vector which is very close to that we get more or less the same number we also mentioned that 10 delta and power factor in most cases are same up to 10 degrees and if there is a significant difference between 10 delta and power factor then the insulation is probably very much compromised already. Then further on, we discussed what makes insulation deteriorate. So we said that water is one of the first factors what makes insulation more conductive, which is equal to deteriorated. And the water comes in mostly because the transformer breathes. So the volume of oil in transformer during the day is bigger, during the night is smaller, and then again bigger and smaller, which is something that attracts air inside and air contains water molecules. We also said that gases are developed inside a transformer and gases, they increase the overall conductivity of the insulating system, partial discharge being only one of the processes which produce gas. To be more exact, partial discharge would produce hydrogen or H2. And then there is sludge. Sludge is that that sticky thing, well, not necessarily sticky, which you can find at the bottom bottom of old transformers, which also additionally deteriorates the insulation or makes the insulation more conductive. So these were these were the processes which make the insulation, let's say, older, the same way like human beings get older, transformers and insulation also get older and after that we showed a table and that table was actually the table which shows us the nominal well not the nominal let us say allowed values of tan delta and then we said that for a new transformer 0 0.5 should be uh, tan delta less than 0 0.5 and for an older transformer tan delta should be below one percent if it's more than one percent then we should think about digging a little bit deeper. All these values are referred to 20 degrees Celsius because the tan delta is very much dependent on temperature, as we can see here. And we had an example in which we said, if the tan delta was 
let's say three for 70 degrees Celsius, it is like having tan delta one for 20 degrees Celsius. We also introduce this second uh, table in which we have shown that the, mm, let's say that it is not so straightforward when it comes to allowed values. We can say that uh, the voltage level of the transformer depend, uh, is, influences the overall idea of allowed values. So for extra high voltage, the values are, allowed values are smaller. And then for a high voltage, they're slightly bigger, slightly. And then for a medium voltage, they can be even bigger. We can correlate that with the fact that the higher the voltage, the better the insulation should be. Or the lower the voltage, we can have less perfect insulation, let's just say. And then in each transformer, let's not forget that we don't describe only with one number, tan delta, we describe it with minimum three numbers. And then we have insulation between high voltage and low voltage. And we have insulation between high voltage winding in the tank and low voltage winding and the tank. And usually high voltage and low voltage are the most important one, is the most important one. Uh, you may see that for each transformer, the request is that this particular insulation has the best property. So you can see that here. Now, after that, what do we we've done, we have said that voltage, testing voltage, should not be bigger than 12 kilovolts, since all the polarization processes are finished at that voltage. So even if you go to the higher voltage, it won't change the result, or the nominal voltage, which means that if you have 10 to 04, uh, 10 kV to 04 kV transformer, you are not expected to do a test at 12 kilovolts which might compromise your insulation so your nominal voltage or 12 kilovolts also just to say 10 kilovolts has been often used also as one of values which is often used to test frequency frequency should be as close as possible to nominal 50 or 60 hertz with the chance to go maximum plus or minus 2 hertz in order to execute a test. After that, we described in detail the measurement procedure. We can sum it up as first, disconnect and de-energize the power transformer. So that would be step one. Then short circuit the windings, short circuit the primary, short circuit the secondary. And if there is a tertiary, you should also do that in order to create two or three different potentials. We don't need to short circuit with a thick wire. We can do it with a thin wire. Then we should ground the test set and connect the cables. Grounding is of the utmost importance. And the test set should be grounded in the same point where the transformer is grounded. If not, you might get some, let's say, crazy values. Then we set up the measurement in the firmware by choosing where you connected the generation, whether to high voltage or low voltage, and what we want to measure. And then so which, which uh, capacitance we want to measure. And after that, we do the measurement of CH. For example, if we connect to the high voltage uh, winding, we can measure CH and CHL, and also maybe the sum of these two. Later you will see why I mentioned this. And then we hit the emergency button before we approach the transformer and we shift. We don't generate on the high voltage side and measure from the low, but we now generate on the low voltage side and we measured from the high voltage side. We do this in order to measure CL, which is this one here. And with the same setup, we can also measure CHL to confirm that the result obtained with high voltage generation on the high voltage winding and with the high voltage generation on low voltage winding is the same number. And we can also, after measuring CL and CHL, measure directly the sum of these two, again, to be sure that the measurement is consistent and without any flaws. After doing that, we remove the short circuit, short circuits, and our next step is me measurement of bushing, measurement of tan delta on bushings. On a bushing, you have two capacitances to measure. One is C1 and the other one is, of course, C2. C1 is the capacitance 
of all the capacitive plates inside, basically from the top until the tap. The tap is the test tap, and the test tap exists mostly on high voltage bushings. If we have low voltage bushings, often we will not find a test tap, but in that case, we can use a tap adapter, uh, sorry, not a tap adapter, a hot collar, which helps us do this measurement. And then also, we need to measure C2. In order to measure C2, we just need to shift, we need to shift actually these to uh, the generation and uh, the measurement. And while measuring C2, we will generate here and we will measure here. Now we do that, we do that, and uh, in order to measure C2. Uh, pa, 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 pa. Okay, I still see that some people are having problems with the sound. I don't know what can we do apart from, let's say, I could talk slowly, more slower, and see if if you have if you haven't heard something, then at least what I can promise you is that you will get a video with all this when we finish. Uh, in the morning. The, everything worked fine, so let let us hope that this will uh, fix the problem will be fixed by itself. Now moving on, the next step was that we need to evaluate our results. So since we need to evaluate our results, we need to compare them. I mean, the ways how we can do that, we can either compare them to previous values or we can compare them to allowed values, the ones in the table, or we can compare phases. If we measure three bushings, we can compare the results of phase A, B, and C and inspect the same numbers. Or if we test cables, what we can do is uh, we can compare three phases. Fourth way how we can assess the results is if we have the same asset, with the same age and same producer uh, in the substation. For example, two transformers, same power, same producer, same age. And if we measure one, we expect more or less to get the same numbers from the other one. Uh, number 17 would be if in the end we see that some values are suspicious, let's say bigger than 1%, what we can do is a sweep, voltage or frequency sweep, and we can continue if with the monitoring of tan delta, if we find this system to be particularly, uh, let's say critical, like a big transformer, which is giving power to a whole city or something like that, that's then what we want to do. We can do a monitoring of tan delta. By the way, let me just inform you that as we are doing that, uh, Veronica is uploading uh, some of the handouts uh, they will be there will be two brochures, uh, sorry, three brochures, and you will of course get this presentation. So you can download that from the handouts session. I see now that the sound is a little bit better. Uh, now let me continue, and then while uh, we will have some, well, let me do it like this. Before we continue, I would like to send. Uh, a question. So you will have a minute and a half to answer this question and if you listen carefully I'm sure you will be able to answer this. So tan delta is a method in which we are and then select one of the following generating AC current and measuring the angle between the current and voltage or generating DC voltage and measuring the angle between current and voltage or we are measuring, generating AC voltage and measuring the difference in angle, or generating DC current and measuring angle between current and voltage. So feel free to vote. I see that already 20% of you guys have voted. In the meantime, I will check if there are some questions. Why do some clients ask for variable frequency? Uh, we will answer that questions later, Mr. Neraj. So the variable frequency is for frequency sweep. 
uh, temperature is the temperature of the oil if we are measuring so the, the question for Benji de Jesus uh, temperature uh, which is requested is the temperature of the oil if we are measuring the tan delta of the body and the temperature of the ambient if we are measuring the tan delta of the bushing so I hope that answers your question um, what is the value of tan delta acceptable for distribution transformer well I would say even up to two percent but not more than that uh, depending on whether what is the voltage distribution transformer can be 10 kilovolts but it can also be 60 kilovolts so the higher the voltage lower should be the tan delta uh, let me see so now we have 75 73 percent people have voted and 76 percent of the people got it right so it is c generate ac voltage and measure the angle so very good i'm proud of you guys so we will close the poll and let us continue. So after this, uh, let me see. Okay, okay, I think we've answered all of your questions. And now we proceed. Actually, what you will see now is uh, where we picked up, uh, where we left, uh, where we stopped last time. We had an example in which we were measuring tan delta on a transformer generating 10 kilovolts. We actually generated 9,994.4 kilovolts. We measured 12.855 milliamps. 300 is maximum with TD5000. And we see that the capacitance which we measured was 4.0975 nanofarad. So this is a typical uh, capacitance for, I would say, a high voltage transformer. And this is actually this capacitance. When we said that we will model the insulation, excuse me, as a capacitance, this is the capacitance we, which, which we had in mind. And we measured that this is 4.09. And then here we see the parallel resistance. And this is the parallel resistance. This is now the resistance connected in parallel to our capacitor. These two parameters, if we take this formula here, allow us to calculate tan delta and if what i did i actually put the, these numbers in a formula and i really did get 0 0.228 percent so this was correct measure then next step would be looking at this parameter here angle phi so this angle here as you can see is 89.8692 it is this angle here it's this angle and delta, as you can see, is 90 degrees minus this angle. That's what we said, 90 degrees minus phi, which means that delta is actually 0 0.1308 degrees. If you take a calculator and you, re and you check what is the tangents of 0 0.1308, you will find out that it is nothing else but 0 0.228. So this was one way how to uh, understand your results and uh, let me see if I have a so uh, some questions are about C2 uh, we will come to that uh, Mr. Rabih is asking about very low frequency uh, it, it is not wrong very low frequency is a method mostly used on cables we are here emphasizing more our um, measurement on on transformers but cables is also uh, cables since they have a higher capacitance we use a lower frequency so that the device could be smaller again question about c2 we will come to that uh, okay and, and 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 again which is allowed limit as per standard or it's a practical value this is a standard one percent and the practical value can be even a little bit more. So it's an IEEE standard to have the value below 1%. But again, I need to emphasize, we cannot put one number on all assets. If I talk about power transformer, then 1% is okay. But we see that with extra high voltage, sometimes it needs to be much less than zero uh, than 1%. So let's say that 1% is a, is a rough estimate. Uh, a conservative, uh, I might even add, but not for all types of transform. 
So more or less, that's that's the thing I wanted to to mention. Um, now, excuse me for that. Uh, let's move on and go to the next slide. In the next slide, we see that we are also assessing power factor. So power factor is nothing but cosine of this angle here. And cosine of 89.8692 would be, again, 0.228%. And then we have RS. RS is the equivalent resistance connected in series with this capacitance in order to have the tan delta which we mentioned before. So we can also calculate that value from, uh, we can calculate that value using this formula and I've entered the values and I really did get 1,775 ohm. The measured value is 1,786 ohm and there is less than 1% error between these two. QF means quality factor and it's nothing but a reciprocal value of absolute tan delta. So absolute tan delta is not actually 0.228%, it's 0.00228, and if you take the reciprocal value of 0.00228, you get 543.02. Long story short, QF needs to be bigger than 100 in order to have a good insulation. Now, having said that, we see that we have percentages here and we have absolute values. So let's clarify that thing to understand uh, why, why do we express sometimes our result in percentages and why is it sometimes in absolute values. So we can have 0 0.00228 or 0 0.228 because tan delta is a non-dimensional number. We divide amps with amps we get a number which is actually very small. You see, if I have 0 0.1 degrees, if delta, and this is more correct interpretation, if delta is 0 0.1, then tan delta is 0 0.00175. If it's a quarter of a degree, it's 0 0.00436. If it's 0 0.5 degrees, it's 0 0.00872. And if it's 0 0.57 degrees, it's 0 0.00995. Since I don't want to say zero so many times, what I do, I multiply with 100, and then I get the values in percentages. So 0 0.17, 0 0.43, 0 0.87, and 0 0.995, which leads us to believe that if the angle is zero point, if delta is 0 0.58, our angle, our tan delta is more than 1%. Or let us put it, let's put it like this, if this angle, is smaller than 89.42, we have a problem. So this is the answer to the question why we express in percentages our results. Now, I will show you a new slide. This is the slide I have not shown this morning to, to the guys and girls because uh, I was requested by my colleague to make this. Uh, this is, I've put this because, I've put this here because um, I think it's a good idea to have an idea how much should we expect when it comes to capacitance from different assets. So this is kind of a guideline, guideline what capacitance should we expect when we talk about power transformer or when we talk about bushings or when we talk about rotative machines or cables. So, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 I have made a small error here. Uh, 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 I think I will need to start this once again. Excuse me for that, we were somewhere around here, okay. So, moving on, uh, what we can see is that for a power transformer, the expected value of capacitance is between nanofarad and few tens of nanofarads. This is our expectation. Of course, it can be less than nanofarad, it could be a little bit, I don't think it will be more than 100 nanofarad, but this is what you expect. Bushings, on the other hand, 
is always a few hundreds of picofarad. It's not more than that. I've never seen it. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but it rarely. And maybe for a very small bushing, it could be maybe tens of picofarads, but picofarads. Rotative machines are beasts. They are big physically. They are huge machines. And since they are huge machines, they have a very big capacitance. So capacitance are from few hundred nanofarads to, let's say, microfarads. With our device, you can, I forgot to say, measure up to three microfarads with uh, STS and TD or TDX and some RCTDs with some reactors. And cables, well, cables, the overall capacitance heavily depends on the length. But if we take one example, a 20 kV cable XLPE would have 0.36 microfarads per kilometer. So with our device, we would be able to test, let's say, successfully 800 meters of this cable because 300, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, no, that, that was the wrong calculation on my side. So it depends, of course, we should, we would take, this, we should take this into calculation. It would be more, a few kilometers, three point something kilometers with our device, which can generate maximum 300 milliamps without any reactors. So this is to serve as a guideline, not as a rule, but I think it's a good idea to have something like this. Now I prepared for you guys something which um, something which which I think you will find useful. But before that, uh, before that, let me. Uh, so Enrique was asking, what is RS? RS is so if we have this standard equivalent scheme which is this one here. And if we then want to have an equivalent scheme in which they are not connected in parallel, but in series, the, the same capacitance. So the question is, if I want to change this connection from parallel connection of capacitance and resistance, and the capacitance should stay the same, what should be the resistance? And this is the formula which we use. Generally, it is not something which is physically uh, which uh, the uh, people who work in measurement, uh, people who work in measurement, which they use, but uh, they are not possible. They, they, uh, it is just a parameter with which we can now uh, say that we can calculate that. So it is not an important, I would say, very important thing, but many people ask, so this is why I answered this question. Uh, the PowerPoint file will be shared later. Uh, Mr. Arthur Rigo is asking if the machines have smaller, si similar sizes, they will have similar capacitance. Uh, that is true if they have similar insulation, then yes. For instance, small generator 2 megawatts and big power transformer 10 megawatts, which are close in size. Uh, once again, I cannot answer that because it depends so if physically they're the same made from same insulating material they will surely have similar capacitance so for that that is a yes but again big machines which are sold machines which have megawatts of powers have been tested in factory for tan delta for power factor so contact your producers they will send you the original uh, the original numbers and then you will be able to make a comparison while you are testing. So that's the thing. Um, and once again, PowerPoints will be shared to all of you. We will not send them to you in a mail, but there is a handout section. And in a handout section, you will be able to find PowerPoints. We also had a question from Mr. Dave. Uh, what is the standard number? I will check that. It's IS, IEEE 57 point something. I need to check. I'm sorry. I don't know by heart, but what I wanted to share with you right now is a video in which my colleague Matteo recorded the screen of, uh, of a um, TDX, uh, sorry, of STS, while he was setting up the measurement. And I hope this will help you understand how to perform the setup of the screen. So let me now share, let me see. If I do this, if I do this, 
I should get the screen and on the screen, I will open the video and I will be quiet now and you guys observe what is being done. One, two, three. Okay, so I see that we have finished this and we're going back to presentation. I hope you like what you saw. This can be very useful to the people who are already using some of our equipment to be sure how to use it. In the meantime, I managed to answer some questions. So the standard which I was checking was IEEE 621995. Uh, there are newer standards, but the one I was reading was that one. Also, I answered that surgery resters can also be tested for tan delta. And uh, look, um, let us now continue. Otherwise, if I keep on answering questions, this will take at least three hours. So let's let's do it like this. Um, maybe. It's good if we do most of the questions at the very end because we are maybe at one third of a presentation and we passed more than fifty percent of the time. So uh, let's let's continue now and let's see example one. Example one is actually the example 
which was shown last time. What I want to emphasize here and now is the fact that we are measuring few parameters. As you know, we measure CH, the capacitance between high voltage mining in the ground, and CHL. And in this transformer, which has primary, secondary, and tertiary side, uh, we saw that insulation between high voltage and ground is quite good. Insulation between high voltage and low voltage is also good. Both of these numbers are below 1%. We can see that. We can also check the capacitance, 4 and 3. We said that this is the standard capacitance from few nanofarads to few tens of nanofarads. And then we will also measure not just CH and CHL, but also CHT, the capacitance between the high voltage and tertiary, which also has a good insulation. So all of these insulations are below 0 0.3, which is very good. And then in one shot, we can also measure CH plus CHL plus CHT. So this is in one shot. Later you will see why this is possible. And we also see that that insulation is good. And what is a trick, not a trick, but the way how to make sure that the measurement is consistent and that you are not measuring just some crazy values. Well, you sum up. You sum up, you measure CH, CHL, and CHT. And then you measure all three of them from one shot. And when you, when you did that, you got 10.5077. And then you use a calculator and you sum up these three values and you get 10.5086. And you get a delta of 1.1 picofarad. 1.51 picofarad in respect to this is 0.01% of error. And this is something which shows you that you are not just doing some mumbo jumbo, that you are actually measuring good results and that this is a worthwhile process. So this is uh, this was example number one. Example number two is similar to this one. Here we had a transformer which had two windings, primary and secondary. Now, since we know more than before, we can take a look and we can see that we generated 10 kilovolts, 24 milliamps went out, 50 hertz was the frequency. We measured 7.8, again, few nanofarad. Tan delta was 0 0.18, very good result. Quality factor is very much above 100. We had some losses, which are normally there, and this is the parallel resistance. But anyway, here we said that by we measured CHL, and now I will turn your attention to another thing, which we will explain later. We did that using a UST mode. So we used a USTA mode. UST stands for, for ungrounded specimen test. Then we measured CH, capacitance between the high voltage winding and the ground. But here we use the GST mode. Later again, we will explain what's a UST, what's a GST. And again, we get a good result. We can verify the capacitance is 7.8, 8.1. And in next step, we measured CH plus CHL. And of course, we expected is that this capacitance is the sum of two previous capacitances. So, it turns out that it really is. CH is 8.1, CHL is 7.8. Measured CH plus CHL is 15.9879. And if we sum up these two values, we get 15.9862, which is the error, which gives us the error of 1.7 picofarad, which is 0.01% accuracy error. So this is something which is important to mention. Now, uh, in the meantime, while you were watching the video, my colleague turned my attention to the fact that I said I made a little boo-boo before. I, I made an error by saying that we can measure up to 3 microfarad. No, we can measure up to 200 microfarad. So since we made a few years ago a certain change in uh, the frequency at which we can measure, we can go from 1 hertz to 500 hertz, and with a lower frequency, we can measure higher capacitance. So we can measure up to 200 microfarad, and we are here measuring 15 nanofarad. So there is much, much, we can measure much more than we measured here. Once again, the bigger capacitances are reserved for cables and rotary machines. Medium, I would say, capacitances for power transformer, lower capacitances for bushings. Now, uh, the third example is quite interesting. 
this will now lead us to the next part, which will be frequency sweep, but also voltage sweep. Sweeps means change. So we pass through different values of frequency or voltage, and we measure tan delta on different frequencies or different voltages, only one of these two. We don't uh, do at the same time both. Now, in this particular case, what we did, we measured a uh, bushing on a power transformer. It was 110 kV power transformer. And when we did the first measurement, we saw that the value was quite big. But just a short, small digression for the ones who haven't heard before, the bushing tan delta is measured by using this tap. Usually you need to unscrew it and then connect. Uh, only high voltage, only high voltage bushings have this. Low voltage bushings don't have it and you use hot color in order to measure that. But in order to do that, you first need to clean your bushing. Cleaning of the bushing is of the utmost importance. Otherwise, the leakage current is too big and you might get false positives, let's say. So the first method, the first measurement gave us the value of 2.7. Now, 2.7 is nothing, not, not a sight you want to see when you measure this. Observe that we also did, we measured the capacitance of 146 picofarad. So 0.146 nanofarad, and this is what we said before. The bushings have few hundreds of picofarads. Uh, when we saw that, we understood that we need to investigate further on. So the first thing we did, we did voltage sweep. Now, voltage sweep is not something you do on such a test, but we did it here just to see how will it react. Basically, what we expected is that the mm, capacitance stays the same. So this is the first thing you want to see when you do a voltage sweep. Capacitance should always stay the same. Uh, whether you do a measurement of capacitance with one volt or with 100 kilovolt, capacitance is a physical reality which describes mostly the construction and the insulation and it shouldn't change with frequency. Tan delta does change with frequency, but not capacitance. And we wanted to prove that, so we did tests at 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12 kilovolts, and we saw that the capacitance is the same, 146 picocoulomb for all points. One thing which does change, and it should change, is current. And in this case, it changed in a linear fashion. So we had 91 uh, micro, 0 0.18 milli. So you can see these are very small currents. And they're, uh, we could say, uh, increasing, which is normal. But tan delta is also changing its value. And this is something we don't like. But then we, we did the next step and we finally said, let's do the measurement of, let's do the measurement of, uh, I'm sorry, the frequency sweep. So the frequency sweep means that we were going to change the frequency. What we did, we used 20, 35, 50, 135, 220, 305, and 400. So we went from 20 to 400 hertz in order to uh, see how will tan delta change. So now you need to understand that uh, we will expect to see also the current to change a little bit, but what changed a lot was tan delta. You see that the first tan delta was 5.8, then 3.7, then 2.8, then 1.4. So the first one was 5.8 and the last one was 0.8. And you could draw this nice curve, and this nice curve tells us that we do have a problem with this bushing. Apart from the fact that at about 50 hertz, the capacity, the tan delta is 2.8, we see that it changes in this fashion, and we will also see that it is the same with phase B. So previously it was phase A. For phase B, the situation is slightly better. Again, we check the capacitance, which is about 100, between 145 and 147 picofarad, which is more or less the same. We can always see here 
how the capacitance more or less doesn't change, but tan delta again changes. In this case, from 1.8 to 0 0.6, and then we move on to phase three. And in phase three, we see that it goes from 4.9 to 1.8. Again, capacitance is more or less the same, small change here. And then we come to bushing number four, and here we see the capacitance, uh, sorry, the tan delta changing from 10 all the way to 1.2. So this is the biggest change, and obviously this bushing was the most affected bushing. So all this four measurements prove that we have a problematic bushing. Now, um, let me now try and explain why does this happen. So first of all, the thing is that um, if we do the measurement of tan delta, if we do the measurement of tan delta from very low frequency, not from one hertz, but from one millihertz, all the way up to 1000 hertz, let's say, which you can see here. So one milli, 10, 100, one hertz, 10 hertz, 100. Here we would have about 1000 hertz. We should get a curve like this. You can see this full black thick line. And this curve, actually, we can say also that certain segments of the curve are affected with, uh, with certain factors. Moisture affects this part and this part. Geometry affects this part and this part. And oil conductivity affects the middle. Now, what happens if I have a good transformer? Let's say this is 50 hertz. And I do a measurement at 50 hertz and I get this number. And then maybe I want to do a measurement at, let's say, 50 and then a higher value, maybe a little bit before. I, will, I might have a small decrease and then more or less either small change in as the frequency increases. But the problem is that as the insulation degrades and as the water starts coming in, this curve moves to the right. And that's what I tried to, uh, to show with this thinner curve. So this is the same curve, but it moved a little bit to the right. And now you can see how will, how will it be different if I do a test from here, from this point on, or from this point on. Well, obviously, if I do, when the water comes in and I do a sweep, I will first have a big fall. And then the value will more or less stay the same. It will not change a lot. While for a normal insulation, it will change just a little bit. And then here it will fall just a little bit. And then it will stay more or less the same or, or have a steady increase, a very small steady increase. So point here being is the fact that you, if you see this, you know you have damaged insulation. Okay. So uh, with this, I would like to conclude that all four bushings were changed and uh, measurement was repeated. And values were very, very much within normal when we put in normal different bushings. And uh, also to emphasize once again, the measurement point on the bushing are usually found only on high voltage bushings. If your bushing has no measurement step, then you should use a hot collar. Also, when measuring tan delta in bushing, it is a good idea to first clean thoroughly the bushing to get more accurate results. Now, let me now show you one more example, and then we will have a short poll. This is a short example of testing uh, medium voltage cables. It was done in Turkey in a refinery. It was a 6 kV cable, and we did it with nominal value. So you can see here, it was six kilovolts, and we got a very small number for tan delta. The connection is done, it's very simple. You generate on the conductor and you measure from the shield, and you get a number 0.013%, which is practically the expected value for something like this. Now, I'm going to launch a second poll, and in the meantime, I'm going to check the questions. So let me see. Let me 
let's see poll number two poll number two would be would be okay so the question is this should be easy right now so the question is when we have doubts if the insulation on a bushing is compromised we usually do a frequency sweep or b voltage sweep so place your votes place your votes and in the meantime i'm going to check the questions Okay, 56% people voted, and for now it's 82 versus 18. Come on, come on, make me proud. Okay, 69 people voted, and we have 80 versus 20. And let me say that the correct answer is, of course, frequency sweep. We will close the poll. And now let's move on. Uh, let's take a few questions. So Mr. Sakashi is asking, please share previous presentation on handout. So please, everybody who wants a presentation, just contact Ms. Veronica. Contact Ms. Veronica and you can get a presentation on the previous beginner's course, this course, morning course. It's not an issue to send you the presentation. You will not be left without a presentation. And in case you don't get the presentation, I will leave my email with you and I can send you the presentation directly. Also, another question, another uh, thing is that if you go to YouTube and write Tan Delta webinar, you will see the last week's webinar and this week's webinar. So let's just to clear this. Uh, the next question, why tan delta changes with change in voltage? Well, the tan delta, that was a question from Mr. Niraj. It's because of polarization processes which happen inside the insulation. If, uh, I don't know if you remember the studies of electronics, where you have uh, electrons and you have the holes. And when you have electrical, field between them, then uh, even though you might have a semiconductor or an insulator, there are some free electrons inside and as they move, they do conduct a little bit. So at 12 kilovolts, this all stops and you shouldn't have any uh, additional conductivity or your delta should be the same. Uh, Mr. El Hadi Salem, how can we prove the accuracy of TD5000 to the final customer, how to calibrate? Uh, and who can do the accredited calibration. One of the ways I can suggest is uh, CapCal. CapCal is a device which has a very, very accurate reference calibrator inside, reference uh, capacitor inside. It's about 1053, if I'm not mistaken, peak of fire, and that's the best way how to prove the accuracy to the customer. If not uh, like that, so this is the verification. The if the calibration is correct then that's all you need to do if it's not correct then what you need to do is send it to isa and then we can calibrate it for you so mr salem i hope this is this answers your question mr niraj g what is hot color hot color is a belt it looks like a belt which you wrap around the bushing bottom of the bushing not complete bottom but around the penultimate rib i would say and you use it to simulate, to emulate the measurement point, which doesn't exist on your on your uh, medium voltage or low voltage bushing. The same from Mr. Pablo Strata, hot color. What is hot color again? So as I said before, it's used to measure a situation, the time delta on bushings which don't have a tap connector. Uh, Mr. Saruj is asking in which mode we should test the tan delta of power cable. It depends. There are a few modes. Sometimes it's a GST, sometimes it's a UST. Uh, is it advised to measure tan delta and capacitance and surge arrestor? Yes, it is advised to do something like that. You can definitely assess the state of your insulation. It's just in that case, I think the values can be a little bit higher than 1%. 
Mr. Arthur Rigo is asking, will we also have the PowerPoint? Yes, of course. If you, you as I said, just write to Miss Veronica and you can get the PowerPoint. Mr. Muhammad Zakir, what actions to perform if the values are greater mainly for power transformers? At what value should we put out the transformer? So it is not an easy question. If the if the value is bigger than expected, bigger than let's say maximum value, what I would first do is I, if it's not too big, uh, the value, I would leave the transformer running, but I would do the measurement more often. So let's say every three to six months and or if it's a very important transformer then what i what i would suggest is maybe the monitoring continuous monitoring of tan delta uh, mr emerson is asking so when uh, we do sweep frequency for an insulation to be good tan delta should be constant below one percent along the range of frequency applied during the sweep frequency test I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Can you please rephrase the question? So I'm sure I understand it. Mr. Juan Alegre, you can tell of tangent delta negative in the test. Yes, later we will talk about negative values of tan delta. Uh, Kim is asking, why don't you show power factor as a label in test results? Uh, Kim, I'm not sure I understand. What do you mean by that? I mean. Are you saying why don't why do we use the name tan delta or something else? Uh, Mr. Santoso is asking how to differentiate if the char change of tan delta during voltage sweep are caused by polarization or by partial discharge. Partial discharge doesn't affect tan delta. Partial, I mean, these are two different things. Tan delta is something like a statistical value of conductivity of our insulation, while partial discharge are sparks. So. Uh, uh, it, it's polarization. It's, it's partial discharge can deteriorate the insulation, but it cannot be, let's say, presented in the same playing field as uh, as polarization. These are two similar things which are not necessarily the same thing. So let's move on. And uh, okay, we have a few more questions, and then we'll proceed. Which mode shall be measured for rotative machines, motor generators? Many of them, probably all of them. We will check that very sh in the next part, Mr. Dave. Does sweep frequency test give an average value of the frequency mean as a final result? Sweep frequency, average value of the frequency. I, I, I'm not sure I understand. So with sweep frequency, you get discrete steps and the value of tan delta you don't get any mean values just discrete steps and mr mohatni is asking what frequency range is to be applied in frequency sweep test well you can do let's say 20 35 50 75 105 135 205 305 400 something like that this would be if you use our device when you choose frequency sweep you get certain set of frequencies which we suggest uh, i would just say that it's slightly more important lower frequencies it's more important to do it well in lower frequencies and mr Youssef has a question and then we will proceed how much times we should do tan delta for 225 60 11 kv each five years for example well each five years it's okay it would be better if you can do it let's say every three years but five years it's also okay especially if it's a newer transformer if it's an older transformer every two to three years for an uh, for a newer transformer every five years should be acceptable okay let's move on uh, now in our next step we would like to show you a voltage sweep how it's configured in a firmware which will be another video so let's go let me show you that video how will you configure a 10 delta sweep once again i'm going to mute my mic and you enjoy the process
Okay, so right now, I hope you uh, understood what was going on. And before we continue, I'm going to try and turn on the mic from my colleague, Mariela. She wanted to say something. Uh, just a second. Let me see. Let me see. Show change presenter settings. Veronica, I hope you can hear me. Do you know exactly where can we, where can we add Mariela as a presenter or a change a presenter? Uh, yes, I can do this for you. Please, please just uh, uh, open I, Mariela's Andrei, mic. I, I didn't receive the presentation. Can you please send it again so I can upload in, into the handout? Sure, sure, sure. Turn on Mariela while she's talking. I'll try to do this. Yes. Mariela, are you here? I don't see Mariela um, between the attendees. Let me see. Change presenter. Mariela. I just saw her a second ago. Maybe with the key. Ah, uh, okay. Found it. Okay. No, no, Mariela is now telling me through WhatsApp that she doesn't want to talk. Okay, so then uh, okay. we'll, we'll just proceed. Uh, look, I will send you this later because if I start sending this to you right now, then uh, I cannot present. So sure, I've sure, sent no it to you in WeTransfer and uh, everybody who wants a presentation will get a presentation. Everybody will get a video. You don't have to ask for it. It's not a problem. And even if you don't get it, you will be able to find it on YouTube. So just to anticipate some of the future questions. Now let's move on because we have only 28 more, uh, 18 more minutes and I do have a lot of slides to show. So uh, when we talk about the voltage sweep, when we talk about voltage sweep, then we should keep in mind that it's a good tool to assess the state of rotary machines. So a rotary machine or a generator or a motor or anything like that can uh, be presented also like a transformer with primary, secondary, and tertiary. In that case, we need to measure a few different uh, values. We need to measure the capacitance between, uh, okay? we need to measure capacitance between each phase and the ground and between phases, like for a transformer. So you can see here phase A ground, phase B ground, phase C ground and phase A, phase B, phase B, phase C, and phase A, phase C. In order to do that, we need to uh, also sometimes use an RCTD, the reactor, and this is because we have a high capacitance on such a machine. Uh, we can see that this is the machine, this is the insulation of the machine, rotary machine, and if we add in parallel the inductance, and this is nothing but an inductor, inside you have two windings, two windings of wire which are 40 Henry each and can withstand up to one amp. So altogether you can have two devices, which is four coils, which is four amps altogether. Uh, this is something which can help us test a uh, rotary machine. Just a second. My presentation has blocked for just a second. So just stop it and I'll start it again. So we were here. Now, when we connect a proper number of, of inductors and we choose a good frequency, we can reach the point. We can reach the point at which we have a maximum impedance of the system. With the maximum impedance, the current which will come out from our uh, from our machine, from, you know, from our machine, but from our test set will be the lowest, and that's what we're looking for. So we can also calculate what should be the necessary frequency, and the connection 
should be done like this. So this would be the STS or the TDX. The generation should be connected to the same point where the reactor is connected. This is the load with resistance in parallel. And we have some more connections here on the reactor. In short, we will do, as we said, the voltage sweep. And usually the standard is 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, and then 80, 60, 40, 20 in order to get a good measurement. And here we have one example. We tested a motor. This wasn't a small motor, but it wasn't extremely big. What we see here is uh, we grounded, of course, the motor's tank, and we see the scheme of a motor. Now, very important thing to emphasize, the first step should be to remove the star point here if it is possible. If it is not possible, then we can only measure one value of 10 delta. Okay, so if we can remove the star point here, then we will measure insulation between each phase and the ground and between phases. But if we don't have this ability, if we need to short circuit this, we can only measure the insulation between these three phases together and the ground. We would connect the test set to the motor and then we would do different tests. And this is the answer to the question before, which methods do we use when we measure rotative machine? It depends what do we want to measure. So if we are measuring the resistance uh, the I'm sorry the insulation of a certain phase versus ground then we will use a GST G A plus B and we would connect to different uh, phases you will see that later if we are measuring between we use a USD and if we measure all of them between the ground then we use again the same one as before so long story short first step would be generating on phase R and measuring from phases S and T. And that's how we measure insulation between R and the ground, R and S and R and T. And then we switch the generation from R to S and we generate on S but measure from R and T. And we measure the S ground, S, T, S, R. In the third step, again, we change and we generate on last phase as you can see here measure from phase one and two and here we measure t ground and then tr and ts we do we actually do some redundant measurement to confirm that we got good results and then the fourth thing would be short circuiting all of them they should be all short circuited and then we generate for example on r and t and we measure the insulation so this is how we do and then the numbers we expect are slightly bigger, uh, mostly, than the transformer. Uh, apart, if we have modern epoxy resin and polyester impregnated insulation material, in that case, we need to have tan delta below 0 0.5. And if we have asphaltic mica windings, then it can be between 3 and 5%. So, of course, also, if tan delta increases, it is indication that insulation is overheating or the winding is becoming contaminated and if it increases more than one percent then we have a significant deterioration and by correlating capacitance and tan delta we can say that if the capacitance decreases and tan delta increases then we have a general thermal deterioration and if the capacitance increases and tan delta increases then we have a contaminated winding or absorbed moisture inside so this is how we can combine two values to get a better idea what's happening with our rotative machine. Now, one concrete example, this was done in South Africa. The first step I would like to show you is the step in which I made a boo-boo. I made a mistake and I didn't connect properly, so I got the result, which is ludicrous. I got tan delta of minus 1,453. And herein lies the first answer to the question, why do I get a negative tan delta? You get a negative tan delta because you did not connect the grounding of the measurement device and the grounding of a device under test in the same point. 
this is the most common reason why you got a negative tan delta, especially if this number is a very big number. Another reason could be if you didn't choose the correct method. This can also be the reason, but we will see that later. So what I realized is that I didn't connect properly, and then I made the proper connection. I did the measurement, and I found out that I have 0 0.25 as a tan delta, which is a good result. After which, we started doing a tip-up and a tip-down test. Since this was 6.6 .6 kilovolt motor testing, we did it at 20%, which is 1.2, and then 2.4, and then 4, and then 5.2, and then 6.6. .6. This is tip-up. And then the tip-down are same points, but uh, just going down. You can see that the current increases, and here we reached 305 milliamps. Since I was not using any reactors here, this was my maximum. I couldn't... Uh, that's why the frequency here is not 50, but 57.7. What you can see is that the capacitance stays the same, and it's quite big, I mean big. We were measuring between three and five nanofarads before, and now I'm measuring 122 nanofarads. So between 122 and 169, uh, this is the capacitance we measure. So there is like four picofarads difference. And what we want to see is that the tan delta values are symmetrical which means that for 20% 20, 20 here and 20% here, I have the same number, and I do. And also 40% here and 40% here, 1.41, 1.42. 60%, 2.11, 60%, 2.12, which is good. 80%, 2.67, 80%, 2.67, which is good. And this is below 3%. So this is a good measurement, and I was happy with this result. So was the owner of this particular uh, of this particular motor. Uh, and let me now show another example and then we'll have a poll. So this was an example, this still is an example where we combined uh, monitoring and uh, partial discharge, monitoring of partial discharge and monitoring of tan delta or power factor and also monitoring of DGA. It was a transformer in Italy, and uh, we took the value of power factor and tan delta from the same place. So this is the measurement tab on the bottom of the bushing, as you can see here or here. And with the same sensor, with a tap adapter, we take the PD and tan delta with this box we condition the signal so we can have a tan delta. You can also see it here. This would be hygrometer and thermometer, and this would be the connector, the sensor for the bushings, tan delta and PD. We had, as we mentioned, the PD measurement, the DGA measurement, and the tan delta and capacity measurement. So what we found out here is first we talk about PD. So for those of you who are not sure what PD is, it's an abbreviation for partial discharge. Partial discharge is a discharge which happens in the insulation, uh, which doesn't fully bridge the insulation, but only partially. And using a TechIM technology and the TF map, we found out that we have some corona, and we also have something which we called which we call a um, interface PD. We will see what it is. We followed the maximums, which didn't change very much in the repetition rate. And we also followed the value of CO2, uh, sorry, CO and H2 of hydrogen. And hydrogen basically increased very much so, which gave us an indication that it's definitely a PD problem. Uh, and this is what I wanted to show you. This is a tan delta in six months and capacitance in six months, how it changed. You can see these are absolute values. And the absolute values go from 0.4% to 0.5%, which is not a big change. So this, is, this goes to prove that overall insulation, the statistical value of overall insulation is good. But we do have a problem, and we see it with the rise of hydrogen. 
and with the existence of PD. Also, the capacitance, if it changes, it changes a little bit from 275 picofarad, let's say, to 290 picofarad, what we saw here. But what is important, they all change at the same time. So the ambient temperature and humidity somehow affects that a little bit, the, the process measurement process, and we still see that the values are in hundreds of picofarad, as we said, for a device, uh, for, for a bushing, the, the, these should be the values. And what we realized is that uh, there were three activities, uh, symmetrical, I would say, in the transformer. Uh, they contribute to the increase of hydrogen. Uh, there is a high frequency content in the upper part of the transformer, and it was identified as, as interface phenomenon. It was a stable trend, and interface phenomenon happens mostly at the interface, at the border between two insulating materials. In our case, what happened is that the transformer was not filled fully with the oil. There were maybe a few centimeters of air gap at, in the domes of the bushings, which allowed the sparks to generate itself, I mean, to happen. And these sparks, in the end, were producing a hydrogen. What the customer did, they, they degreased and drained and degreased the transformer. It was filled up again with hot oil in order to avoid any kind of empty regions. And transformer was put in service again with the monitoring also turned on. After that, we saw no more PD. It was just noise. So this concludes let's say the second third i don't i know that we don't have too much time so i will quickly launch a third poll so let's see poll number three uh start the question is standard method for testing of rotary machine is voltage sweep that means that we a take the voltage and sweep the floor with it b change the angle between voltage and current or c change the voltage and perform tan delta test in different voltage levels. So please, let's vote. In the meantime, I will see the questions which we have, but we will answer them later. Questions. Okay, we do have some questions. We do have some questions. Mr. Hassan, how do we interpret? We will later talk about negative tan delta. Uh, I also mentioned, I see that most of the questions refer to negative tan delta, and I'm planning to make a, a webinar on that. I will let you know. But for now, let us focus on what we were talking here. So 45% of the people voted, and we have 100% of answers correct. So this is very good. Uh, I know that we have more than 120 people here. Come on, everybody, let's vote. And I will say in five, four, three, two, one, close the polling. 55% people voted. 95% people said change the voltage and perform tan delta test, which was C, and that was the correct value. So congratulations. This is good. Now, let us talk about something else. Let us talk what we said before about UST and GST modes. What are they? So UST and GST modes, there are three modes of testing. One is called UST, ungrounded specimen test. The other one is called GST, grounded specimen test. And GSTG, grounded specimen test guard. So guard here means that some currents are not measured. Specimen means sample. By that, intending the sample of our insulation system. We could also freely say a capacitor. Sample can be also called, in this case, a capacitor instead of specimen, since we are measuring parts of our insulation system or capacitors. And generally, it is good to have as much specimens as possible since it gives us a better resolution when performing a test. So let's see exactly what are we talking about. If we short circuit the primary and the secondary side of a two-winding transformer, we will get a scheme 
which will be like the scheme we see here. So we will have the capacitance between the high voltage and the low voltage, CHL, and we will use UST or ungrounded specimen test to measure this. Why? Because it's not touching the ground. While CH and CL capacitance between high voltage and low voltage is touching the ground, and we will use a GST or a GSTG method to measure these capacitances. The next one is a transformer with three voltage levels, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Again, these will be measured with UST, and these will be measured with GST. Why? Because these do not touch the ground in any point, and these do touch the ground in one point, so that's why we use a GST or a GSTG method with this. So, in order to have a better resolution, it is always a good idea to test the smallest possible sample, thus having a better chance to see the influence of a small imperfection. So, for example, if we have uh, one part of our insulation which is bad, and we test the whole insulation and we get just one number, that one bad point might hide itself in the statistical value because the rest is good. That's why we want to zoom in at different parts in order to be able to make sure that we have a good, uh, we have a good visibility of the problems inside. So we have for a two winding transformer, the insulation between high voltage and ground, insulation between low voltage and ground, and insulation between high voltage and low voltage. We also have insulation inside bushing C1 and also C2. So if we have a transformer and we measure these values for a body of the transformer and these for, let's say, one bushing, we will see that probably CH will have a problem soon. If we had only one number for all this, maybe the number would be 085, and we would say all is fine, but in reality, there would be a problem hiding with the insulation between the high and the low voltage wire. So now, let us completely demystify this and say what is really UST and GST or, or what do we do, how do we decide what to measure. So one could say that the choice of method, UST, GST, GSTG, is a kind of a switch. This is a switch which is placed before the M meter that chooses which currents flow into the said M meter. So let me put it like this. Every time delta device in the world will generate voltage and measure current. And what current we measure reflects on what, what capacitance we measure. If we measure current just passing through here, we will measure CHT. If we measure the current running through here, we will measure CH. And if we measure a current running through here and here, we will measure CH plus CHT. You understand? So in today's modern test sets, we mostly have two inputs, input A, input B, but don't forget that we always have grounding. This is why grounding is important. Grounding is the third input. And this switch, this switch tells me, will, will I just measure this current or maybe only this current? or maybe only this current, or maybe I will measure these two currents, or maybe I will measure these two currents, or maybe I will measure this current and this current, or maybe I will measure all of them. That will define whether I have a UST or a GST. And now let's see how this reflects onto a very nice uh, table. Uh, before that, uh, I'm having some issues, so allow me once again to reset this and start the start from a new ta, ta, ta. I will quickly be there. So by the way, if we have a transformer with primary, secondary, and tertiary, we will use A and B. Transformer which has only primary and secondary side doesn't need to use B. B is used when you have primary, secondary, and tertiary. And this is now a situation where we explain so if we have two current transformer, two current inputs, A and B, and the current measurement uh, through the ground, we get seven combinations. So UST A means that uh, my device is measuring only the current coming to the input A, only one current. UST B 
means that I'm measuring only the current coming to B. And because they are UST, ungrounded specimen test, we can see that ground here is not being measured. UST A plus B will, of course, measure currents coming to inputs A and B. On the other side, GST is a method in which we measure input A, input B, and the ground, all three currents. So that's GST. GST GA measures anything but A, so we guard, we remove the measurement on the input A, GST GB, the same like in this case, we don't measure the input, the current on input B, and GST GA plus B, we just measure the ground current. So this is what we use. We use UST A, UST B, UST A plus B, GST, GST GA, GST GB, and GST GA plus B. One more way to look at it is the fact that since we have a UST method, with a UST method, since we know that we do not measure the ground, we just say what we do measure. UST A does measure A, UST B does measure B, and UST A plus B does measure A plus B. But with a GST method, we have to say what we do not measure. So GST measures all. GST GA does not measure A, GST GB does not measure B, and GST GA plus B does not measure neither A nor B. Another way how to show this is if we have a two winding power transformer, if we say which method needs to be used, if we want to measure CH, we will use a GST GA with the generation high voltage winding and measurement on the low voltage winding. For CL, same method, but we will generate on the low voltage winding and measure on the high voltage winding. CHL can be measured using a UST method because it's not grounded. We can generate on the low side or a high side, the low voltage or high voltage. CH plus CHL is a GST mode, whether and CH plus CHL is this and CL plus CHL is this. C1 is measured using a USTA and for C2, I'm sorry, I forgot to write that in. But now let's see what effectively happens inside. So let's say that we want to measure here that we use a UST method. So UST method is being used. UST method is being used and we want to measure actually CHL. Why CHL? Because it's not touching the ground. Ungrounded specimen test. We generate 12, let's say 10 kilovolt here. As the potential of 10 kilovolt is here, it generates current running through here and a current running through here, right? And if I measure only this current here, this current, and I do not measure this current here because being a UST method by definition, I'm not measuring current coming in the ground, I'm simply measuring the current going through CHL and thus I'm measuring CHL. So which current you measure, that's the capacitance that you measure. In today's devices, what we do is we cannot measure the current running through the capacitor and the current running through the resistor, because that's the modeling of the insulation. We simply generate voltage, we measure the currents on the input, and we measure the angle between the voltage and the current voltage which generates the current and the current which is generated by the voltage and that's how we measure all these parameters if we want to measure a ch we need to we need to use a gstg method which means again i'm generating 10 kilovolts here and then again i have a current running through here and a current running through here a gst method will by definition measure the current going through the ground by definition and even though I have a cable connected to input A, inside, since I'm using a GST GA, sorry, GST GA, guard A means I'm not measuring A, inside I will bypass the M meter like this. So I will just measure this current and I will measure CH. So this also answers the question, why can we just with one connection measure first CH? then, sorry, CHL, then CH, and then CH plus CHL. Because in the first iteration, we will measure only this current and thus this capacitance. 
In the second one, we will measure this current and then this capacitance. And then we will measure this current and this current, which means a parallel connection between two capacitances, which is the sum of two capacitances. Okay. Now we switch. We switch and we generate on the low voltage side. We cannot measure CL if we generate on the high voltage side. We cannot. That's why in the middle of testing, you need to press the emergency button and go and start testing uh, and start generating on the low voltage side. I generate 0 0.5, uh, no, 5 kilovolts here. Let's say this is 6 kilovolts side. And the current will run through here. And we will measure this current here. The yellow cable is connected, but inside I'm not measuring because it's a GST GA, which means guard A, I'm not measuring A. And we can have all kinds of, uh, let's say, combinations here. If I generate on the high voltage side and I choose GST GA plus B, it means that I'm just measuring current running through the ground, which is actually in the end measured capacitance will be the series of CHL plus CL in parallel with CH. This would be one. When we are testing a transformer with primary, secondary, and tertiary side, we use the same philosophy. It's just slightly more complicated. And we have only three more uh, slides before we finish, and then we'll take questions. Why is tan delta better than polarization index, the DC method? First and utmost, the most important reason I didn't write it here is because the DC measurement might damage your insulation. We will explain this later. The first then would be the tan delta results are more repeatable than polarization index, which means that if you do polarization index three times, you will get different results. With tan delta, you get the same results. Uh, the second point is refers to point zero. So with tan delta, you don't leave any free electrons inside your insulation. You simply don't because uh, it's an AC method, while the DC method tends to leave a lot of free electrons inside of, insula inside of your insulation. If you have had some, uh, some, some, some voids, some holes, little microscopic holes inside of your insulation, now with electrons inside, what can happen is that it can trigger a PD. And that's why a DC method slowly is being abandoned because it might damage your insulation. Tan delta is also a faster test and tan delta also is a test which uh, is giving us more, I mean, we use our transformers with an AC voltage. So it's better to test them with an AC rather than DC voltage. And of course, TD is better because, or power factor is better because it's time independent. Now, PD and TD, two sides of a different story. I mentioned when I was doing the morning session that what's better, PD or TD, is like asking whether you like your mother or your father the best. Both of them you like, you should, I hope, because both of them love you the same way like these two methods allow you to understand how to maintain your transformer. But each one of them gives you a different point of view. So first of all, since PDs are micro sparks that partially bridge the insulation, they can give you one point of view, while TD is more like an overall statistical value of the insulation's conductivity. So that's their nature. Tan delta shows us the overall state of the insulation while PD is showing us if we have some issues happening right now at this moment. And this is good because if you can correlate, if you see something happening in certain points, for example, when you change the position of on-load tap changer, or when you have an over-voltage, or when you have a fault nearby, then this correlation will allow you to better understand the state of your insulation and what can damage your insulation. Also, uh, the best solution would be continuous monitoring and correlating these values, both PD and tan delta. And also uh, PD is, uh, when I say here in 0.5 better on bushings, it doesn't mean that TD is not good, but PD is usually measured on bushings. And the closer you are to the source of partial discharge, the better you will understand what's happening. So uh, 
And on the other side, Tan Delta can easily measure every aspect of a transformer's body, while PD might have some issues with, with the bottom parts of the tank. So these would be the reasons for P and TD and the question on everybody's mind, negative tan delta. There are different reasons why you have negative tan delta. It's not only one reason. Negative tan delta can happen if you did not connect correctly. Negative tan delta can also happen if the point, grounding point of device under test and your test set are different. Negative tan delta can also happen. Now, I, I still don't have a quote, uh, quote uh, if you have some special additives inside. And, uh, once I read this and I cannot find where, but so for now you can take it with the reserve. And also negative tan delta value, the question first would be how negative? Is it like minus five or minus three or minus one or is it minus 0 0.005? If it's a small value and it's a negative value, then it might be the issue that everything is okay with your insulation. It's just that we might have issues with some measurements if it's a small number. So then it's the question of accuracy because negative tan delta value means that the delta, is, so the, the phi angle is bigger than 90 degrees or there are issues with measurement. So these are some of the reasons. I know there will be a lot of questions about negative tan delta and there were, I think, at least 20 or 30% of all questions are about negative tan delta. And I promise you, I will dig my head into this and try to understand a little bit better. And hopefully one day we will have a webinar on that topic. And having said that, I thank you for your valuable attention. I hope you learned something. And I would just like to tell you that if you want to contact me, this is my email, andre.scpcic at altanova-group.com. But also, if you want to find your distributors or regional offices, go, just go to Altanova Group and then go to Contacts. Having said that, I will now open the questions and see what can we answer. But before that, let me see, let me see one more poll. And in the meantime, I will be checking the questions. So when testing, uh, a <coughs> rotative machine reactor needs to be added due to rotative machine having high, so rotative machine has a high inductance, capacitance, resistance, or vibrations in order. So what is high with the rotative machine so that we need to use the reactor? And in the meantime, let me check the question. 